Welcome to the Growing in Grace podcast, where you can listen in on some casual conversation about the good news of Jesus without all of the inconsistent religious double talk. If you've ever struggled with feelings of hopelessness, guilt, and despair, or wondered if you're really right with God, it's time to discover the true freedom that comes with the gospel of unlimited and overflowing grace. All right, here we go again, the Growing in Grace podcast at growingingrace.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe on, um, well, your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube. We're pretty popular on YouTube, you know. Well, I, I guess I that's not true. I mean, I think it's a place where a lot of people listen to us and comment and, um, and interact with us. Maybe I'll put it that way. Um, it's interesting to me just uh, how things have evolved over the years. I, see, the Growing in Grace website, growingingrace.org, is um, basically it's a blogger site. So people can, you can comment on those posts, but very, very rarely do we ever get comments there. <laughs> but on YouTube, and it just goes to show how the internet has evolved, but we post the the podcast on YouTube every week, and that's where we seem to get uh, the most of the comments there. So I'm Joel Brzezinski, along with Mike Kapler. Growingingrace.org is basically the, the headquarters, but you can listen, of course, on your uh, favorite podcasting app on YouTube and various places like that. So <laughs> thanks for tuning you know, in, whichever way you do it. The the gospel is, is not like technology. Like, I, I was looking for... I was just shopping around for routers. Not that I really needed one at this time, but I'm looking ahead, right? Yeah. So you see some of the newer uh, routers out there. And and I was looking at the comments and the ratings and, and all of that on one particular one. And somebody uh, said something that kind of jumped out at me when, when the, they it came to, you know, getting the thing connected and hooked up. He was um, kind of thrilled to see how things had evolved <laughs> oh. <laughs> in, in, in the ease of getting things set up and connected and working, whereas in the past he had some trouble or had to get tech support. And here you just kind of get on the app and do what it tells you to do, and voila, it, there it's it kind is. of working. Yeah. Um, and, and for some of us, the gospel sort of became like that. The gospel became easier to understand as, as we grew in the knowledge of the truth with the help of the Holy Spirit. But it's always been the gospel. It's it's never really changed. Right. It's just that our understanding of it has changed. So don't confuse that with technology. Yeah, that's the thing. The gospel has always been the same. The gospel has never changed. God never had anything else in mind for the gospel other than what it is. It's just that uh, we human beings have kind of messed things, <laughs> messed things up a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, I'll take some uh, yeah, blame for that, too. You know, over the years, I've, you know, uh, not, not had a proper understanding, and I've shared some wrong things with people over the years. And But like you say, once you really get a good grasp of the gospel, it's kind of like, in a sense, it's set it and forget it, in that it's just it's there now, um, and everything that we learn kind of flows from uh, what the true gospel really is, and it's just it's just helpful to know because people have asked us over the years. A lot of times, I'll get a question in email: What about this verse, or mm -hmm. these two verses, or this passage, or, or whatever? You know, what about that? And in my mind. I always go back to, um, first of all, what is the gospel? Get to, you know, get to know what the gospel is. And, you know, so many questions about this verse or that verse <laughs> can be answered by knowing what the gospel is. And then also it, it goes to where we're, maybe I don't want to get into this, but it kind of goes somewhat uh, to what we were talking about last week. Um, some people are more bibliocentric, you know, centered on the Bible rather than centered on Jesus. And again, we love, I, I like, this came up on one of my Facebook posts from a, a while back and it came up in a memory again, but because someone had accused me of being bibliocentric in a, in a conversation <laughs> I was having with somebody and like, well, we're talking about the Bible. We are talking about the Bible, about what certain verses mean. So it's going to be a bibliocentric conversation. There's nothing wrong with that. 
It's just that I think, and sometimes we get so bibliocentric, and that's, I don't know, that's that was a new word for me, but um, we, we get so focused on what this verse says or what that verse says that we forget the gospel. We forget that it's about Jesus, that it's really about him, and we, we lose sight of him all in search of answers about this specific verse or passage. Not that there's anything wrong with wanting to know what you know, this passage means or that passage means, but um, if you know Christ and the gospel, so many things get, uh, you know, are so easily ironed out from that. I didn't mean to get into all that, but anyway, it popped into my head and I went with it. Well, you know, there's, I, I know we had something else to get into <laughs> and, and we will, I think, but there's something to be said about what you're saying, if that makes any sense. Um, <laughs> and that's the... all I had to say about that. <laughs> No, <laughs> I, I think people, you know, if, if, if somebody like Paul, for example, or something that Jesus was saying, I mean, who are they speaking to and, and what is it that they were trying to say to those people at that time? And how does it apply to us, if at all? Um, because sometimes things were being addressed. We've talked about this briefly, but there's things were being addressed by writers in the New Testament, Paul, for example. Uh, where he was dealing with things that also involved issues and questions about what was going on in their culture at that right. time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even, I mean, there's just, there's so much sometimes historical context that we don't always have a clear picture of. Even historians don't necessarily always agree on some things that could help us understand the meaning of some of these things in the Bible. I mean, for example, when, when uh, the writer of Hebrews was quoting Jeremiah, and said, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We kind of tend to skip over that sometimes. But what does that mean? Mm -hmm. The house of Israel and the house of Judah? I mean, you can do a search on that on the internet and start finding out some very complicated um, historical things regarding the, the nation of Israel and, and the division that took place even within the monarchy back in the Old Testament days uh, between the um, the kingdom of Judah, as it was called, and the kingdom of Israel, which was in the north, kingdom of Judah in the south. There, there was a, a, a split there of, of sorts that you can sort of get into if you really want to. I mean, I, I say all that to say, Joel, is that sometimes we can get so lost, uh, in, you know, taking a dive into the biblical swimming pool, that we try to figure out how do we get out of here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> how do I get my head above water? Yeah, and and so many questions and rabbit trails and and things come out of all this and and if you are if you like that type of thing that's that's fine but you know some people are, um, I think some people are just a little bit scared of what a verse might be saying, and so you just look at the context and you, and and you look at the, the what this gospel is all about why did jesus come who is he what did he accomplish and so many things flow from that so let's we're talking about something we had in mind to talk about something um and this is one of the things this isn't where we were going to start but just as an example of what we're talking about jesus had said in, in the in the what's known as the sermon on the mount matthew 7 21 uh and there's there's some there's even some context to this but for the sake of our conversation maybe we'll get into that maybe not but he Jesus says and this is what kind of scares some people not everyone who says to me lord lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven and right there people are like hey. so you got to be doing you got to be doing you got to be doing he who does the will of my father in heaven Just, he goes on, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now look at that. Isn't that pretty awesome? They've prophesied in his name. They've cast out demons in his name. They've done many wonders. And yet, here's what Jesus says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, what does it mean, he who does the will of my Father? They've been doing all these things. Uh, see, this isn't a person who has lost their salvation. I think that's what people are wondering. Look, I did all this stuff, God. I did all this stuff. And now you're saying, uh, I never knew you. 
Uh, the problem with these people here was that they were focused. They, this is what they brought up to the Lord. Look at what I did. I did this. I prophesied. I cast out demons. I did many wonders. And you may be thinking, how does a, a person who doesn't believe do these things? Well, look throughout the Old Testament. God did a whole bunch of things um, through people. There were prophecies, people who didn't even know who Jesus was because Jesus hadn't come as a human being yet. So anyway, the point here is that these are not people who are believers. These are people who are saying, look at what I've done, Lord. And he's going to declare to them, I never knew you. Uh, depart from me, you, were, you who practice lawlessness. It's, so it's, it's people who didn't believe in him. It, they did all these things. They were confident. They were sure that it was their works that were going to gain them entrance uh, with the Father. Uh, but it, anyway, all in the end, all of their deeds didn't mean a thing. And I believe the reason is because they didn't believe. Yeah, the context here in Matthew 7, uh, and you mentioned there is some context here but before verse 21, shortly before that in verse 15, Jesus uh, was telling his disciples to beware of false prophets. So, I mean, yes. that's the context right. here. Mm -hmm. uh, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but they're really wolves on the inside. You will recognize them by their fruits, you know, the fruit of their own labor, their own works. Um so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree uh, bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So he's talking about, as you said, Joel, one who has found life um, versus uh, a dead tree. Then he goes on to say what you just read there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And I mean, these guys were doing some pretty cool things, right? Casting out demons, prophesy, I mean, all that stuff, mighty works in your name. Uh, but when Jesus said, I never knew you, he, he's not referring to believers in Christ here, uh, obviously. If he never knew somebody, um, then he's talking about somebody somebody else. Right. And um, But you're right, the, the scary verse, uh, I never knew you, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Uh, I don't want to hear those words someday. Well, uh, again, if you don't have the, the context of the passage as well as the context of, of what the gospel is, uh, if you don't uh, have a, a developed mindset in, in that way, then it's going to be easy to just start plucking out verses and wondering what they mean, and uh, especially scary ones, right? Those that are taken out of context and can be used to manipulate people. Yeah, and and so with that, here's you know you were you had brought this up to me before we started recording here um, from Matthew 21 it goes along with all of this. Um, let's see. I, Verse 28, uh, Jesus said, but what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted and he went. So he wasn't, he said he wasn't going to work, but he decided to go and do it. Then he came to the second son and uh, said, likewise. And he answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said to him, the first. The first one did the will of his father. He said he wasn't going to do it, then he went and did it. So Jesus said to them, and now this is this is what is I just love this. This is interesting to me because what he says here, he talks about tax collectors and harlots. Tax collectors and prostitutes. Now back in that day, uh, tax collectors were known as evil people. Uh, let's just put it that way. There's, you can dig into that, what a tax collector was, but they were not very well liked. Uh, they were thought of as evil. Uh, they were not known for being fair and all kinds of things. And of course, harlots, prostitutes. Um, so Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you and by the way the you that he's talking about was um in verse 23 it says he came into the temple the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him so it was the chief priests and the elders he says the tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of god before you and here's what he said the reason for it he says for john came to you in the way of righteousness he's talking about john the baptist and you did not believe him but tax collectors and harlots believed him and when you saw it you did not afterward relent 
and believe him. And the way they're talking about was John's uh, testimony about Jesus. So the difference here, so what's the difference between like the chief priests and elders um, who were going about, they put on a good show in front of people, um, a righteous, a show of righteousness. Tax collectors and harlots, they did not put on a good show of righteousness before other people or before God. But yet they were the ones who Jesus says, the tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. And the reason here is simply because they believed. You notice Jesus didn't talk about their works, but he talked about those who believed. Yeah, verse 32, uh, he said that, you know, John came to you in the way of righteousness. You did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots did. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So I think that's a great point. Jesus would go on to tell another parable, which we won't get into for the, the sake of time. But at the end of it, uh, apparently, along with the chief priest and, and the elders, the Pharisees were also hanging out because after that parable, <laughs> They perceived that he was talking about, about them, them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted to lay his hands on him or lay their hands on him. Uh, hey, wait a minute, you know, give him a little mo slap or something. Uh, <laughs> wait a minute, he's talking about us here. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but he was really already doing that by saying, look, tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. And the, again, the basic difference there is. In context, it had to do with belief. Uh, now he was talking about John, but obviously there was something going on before this about, they asked him about what, what by what authority he does the things that he does. And he wouldn't answer them because he, he wouldn't answer their question. So ultimately it comes down to a belief, not just in John the Baptist, but belief in, in Jesus, the one who does the things that he does by the authority of God. Right. And just to wrap up here with um, this whole thing about belief, um, John 6, if you're listening, for the sake of time, we're not going to read the whole thing, but back up to at least verse 22. But John 6, 28, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And I will just say, just judging by the way they worded it, they believed that there were works that they had to do, plural. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And I think Jesus gave them an answer that they were not expecting. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So let's wrap up with that. The work of God is simply to believe. Him. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski, heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. Access past programs by visiting growingingrace.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.